Thank you for inviting me to India. It's uh, certainly certainly will be an, a very interesting experience for me, and also to to uh, get in contact with you, which I hope we will do later during the tutorial. Uh, I I will give now my lectures. If you have questions, which I hope you will, or comments, we can take that this afternoon in the tutorial. Uh, that is questions concerning the lectures as well as concerning the papers. The papers are meant to overlap more or less with the lectures, but of course there is more material, more details in the papers. Now, uh, I will start now this first lecture. I will talk you why we uh, thought something like cognitive semiotics was necessary and how it has been, how it inspired from different, uh, different other uh, traditions, scholarly traditions. So, we could also formulate this in another way, why cognitive semiotics? And uh, I think this is a rather good uh, justification uh, the purpose of cognitive semiotics is to integrate perspective, methods, and insights from cognitive science, cognitive linguistic, and semiotics, placing meaning making into the broader context of cognitive, social, and neurobiological processes. This is formulation you can find in the journal Cognitive Semiotics, uh, published by uh, Mouton de Greuter which is the official uh, organ of the International Association for Cognitive Semiotics, an association which we founded, uh, I think, four years ago, five, four or five years ago now. And I will mention a little more about that later. So the idea then is to introduce the field of cognitive semiotics, which focus on a multifaceted concept of meaning. And I think this is a question of meaning is what makes this different from cognitive science. So this is why we think that we can contribute to mending the gap between natural science and the humanities, uh, also putting social science in between. Uh, and without trying to reduce one to the other, which is also something which is important to, to uh, cognitive semiotics as opposed to many other approaches. So we want to go beyond uh, a number of persistent dualists such as between body and mind, nature and culture, objective and subjective, science and interpretation. Uh, which is, doesn't mean that they don't, are meaningless. We, we're only trying to give them a more adequate meaning. So I hope after this course you will have some familiarity with some topics and methods in cognitive semiotics. You will see uh, that the history of it uh, goes back not only to semiotics, but to cognitive science and linguistics and as we will see a little moment to phenomenology, we, as a philosophical approach. So uh, knowledge and understanding, I hope you will get knowledge and understanding of the central division blocks within cognitive semiotics, which is meaning at the level of Umwelt, of natural Lebenswelt, cultural Lebenswelt, universal science and universal discourse. These are terms that I will explain somewhat in this lecture and more in the next one. And we also have a more several other concepts uh, like intentionality, sign, affordance, iconicity, indexicality, and symbolicity, uh, which we meet here. Uh, another thing which, in which we insist is uh, in cognitive semiotics, it's important to apply what we call the conceptual empirical loop, 
we ask questions which are theoretically very heavy, you can say, but still we want to translate them into empirical studies and the empirical studies will have an impact on return on the theory. So I hope this will help you to give some capacity afterwards to, to carry out um, a research project inspired by cognitive semiotics. So the simplest model is to say that uh, we have linguistics, we have cognitive science, and we have semiotics, and we put them together and we get cognitive semiotics. Uh, some of my colleagues insist on linguistics being part of this. In a way, I think it's superficial because uh, semiotics al already includes linguistics. Cognitive science already includes uh, cognitive science. Uh, cognitive science already includes linguistics. But, of course, uh, historically, there may be reason to emphasize also linguistics here. And this is the wider circle, which is only an attempt to give some examples. Um, as I said, we want to uh, bridge the gap between the different sciences. So, uh, and we have to do that better than uh, cognitive uh, science has done so far because we don't want to reduce uh, the human and social sciences to natural sciences. Uh, but it, it's relevant for all these disciplines and of course for much more which I have not mentioned here. Now cognitive semiotics as uh, a discipline, as a research center, as far as I know, it only exists with this name on three, in three parts of the world. In Lund, where I come from, in Aarhus, in Denmark, which is rather close to us also, but their tradition, their approach to cognitive semiotics is still different in a way, in many ways, in fact. And we also have um, at Case Western uh, University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, now, we, uh, we three, we took the initiative, we three, the search center took the initiative to create the International Association for Cognitive Semiotics, the IACS. And so far we have had three conferences the first one was in Lund. The second one was in um, Lublin in Poland. And the third one uh, last year was in Toronto in Canada. And you also see here Aachen because that is the next international conference of the International Association for Cognitive Semiotics which will take place um, next year. And I hope somebody of you will be able to come because I don't, although, as I said, the dedicated research centers only exist in three places in the world. At the conference, we get a lot of people from different parts of the world, but I have not seen anyone, I think, from India. So please try to participate too. I hope can, I can inspire you to do that. Um, Yes, uh, and, and we, I think in the conferences we are real, realizing uh, this idea of transdisciplinarity because we get a lot of people from linguistics, from uh, cognitive science, traditional cognitive science, from philosophy, uh, literature, and of course other parts of semiotics, other approaches to semiotics. So, and from many, many countries in the world. So, uh, now I would say something about the specificity of semiotics. Um, the interesting thing about semiotics in this combination is that it's, it's focused on meaning as such. So. We, we try to investigate different kinds of meanings, understand meanings. 
or rather the meaning making of human beings and as we see some also in some other animals. Now meaning has to be an experience. You can't have a meaning which is not experienced. This is not always recognized in semiotics, but I think if it's a fundamental fact. Now, more specifically, what we do in semiotics is we, we look at the difference and similarities between various semiotic resources or semiotic systems. For example, between language, pictures, gesture, etc. And we also look at the relation between semiotic resources. How do they work together? How are they combined? Um, now, in classical semiotics, uh, like this kind of semiotics, which uh, was made by uh, Roland Barthes, for example, who was mentioned here before. Uh, in that uh, semiotics, you had to study the text and not the context. So you should exclude everything which was not precisely the text. And then, of course, text was used in a very wide sense, so it's not only in verbal text, any occurrence of, of some semiotic system. But you should ignore, for example, obstacological, sociological aspects and things like that. And that is something which we do not agree with. Also, uh, following the idea from Saussure, it was concentrated on synchrony, that is, on studying the system as such, ignoring the temporal dimension. On the contrary, we were very interested in the temporal dimension and maybe not so, well, not only what is normally called histor history, but uh, evolution uh, and uh, also uh, child development. These are factors which are of fundamental importance to cognitive semiotics. So, I would see semiotics first as a long tradition of research. And this is something I wrote many years ago in an old book of mine. Semiotic consists of a series of entangled strands of problem areas, making up a continuous discussion extending through the ages, which can only be grasped a posteriori by taking a retrospective view of some restricting parts of this mesh thus permitting semiotics to be defined and applied to new areas and issues. So, in this tradition, Peirce has a place, Saussure has a place, but so have many other thinkers. So, I, I, I don't want to follow up on this division, which is very common between uh, Persian and, and Saussurean semiotics. I think we are beyond that now. So you have to be situated in this, situa this tradition to rework it and extend it. And that's exactly what we are trying to do in cognitive semiotics. Now, in some places, uh, semiotics, and even as, you should, you, you, as I just told you, cognitive semiotics has become a specific discipline at certain universities. But in most places, not. So people in other designated areas work with semiotics or with cognitive semiotics. It's not true, as Saussure said, that um, the place of semiotics or semiology, as he called it, was designated before, determined beforehand, because he was thinking some kind of uh, uh, systematic uh, uh, intellectual uh, system. So he, he may be right from that point of view, but if you get discipline at the university, it has much more to do with sociology than with, with, with science. What you can uh, convince people, I, don't, I suppose that even here you know that. If you want to say, I mean, it's, I think it's true all over the world, you can't impose a discipline only because it is intellectually necessary. You have to somehow make it popular. You have to make, convince people who are in power that it's important. So, so semiotics, 
And cognosemiotics are disciplines in some universities, but not in many. But a lot of people work on them, anyhow. So, my tradition, as I said, is very long. It doesn't consist only of the Sur or Perth. Uh, we can go very far back uh, to where started Augustine and Lessing and many people before. Uh, then we have, in the 20th century, the beginning, we had Russian formalists, the Bachtin Circle, Jakobson, the Prague School, Jemsle, Piaget, Vygotsky, and a little later, French structuralists with Gremas School and Echo, the Tartu School, Prieto. So I'm not going into all these thinkers, but I, I, I think you should keep in the background. All these are relevant to us, but all, because all these are people who have formulated questions about meaning, and they have given answers, which gives rise to other questions, and so on, as I said, in the definition of, a tra of the semiotic tradition. So, mm, okay. But you can also say that semiotics is a very old discipline because uh, the, the central questions of what meaning is was formulated already by Aristotle and Plato, but also, for example, in other terms, by Hippocrates the, in medicine, how you do recognize a symptom. And uh, St. Augustine wrote uh, several treatises, sorry? Hmm? Okay. <laughs> uh, Augustine, who is more famous in the Christian tradition uh, as an interpreter of the Bible and all that, uh, he wrote several treatises about uh, semiotic matters, although he didn't use the term, uh, about signs, in fact. And uh, if you think about the medieval period, uh, there is a lot of books which had the title Treatise of Science. So that was very central all through this period. And you can also say that um, in the Enlightenment in Europe, uh, they also wrote many books with the title Treatise of Science, and man, many talked about science without uh, using that as a title. So, in this sense, you have a very long semiotic tradition. Now, the question is, how does semiotics become cognitive? Well, we have to go beyond this uh, idea of an autonomous semiotics, uh, pure semiotics, uh, which was typical of classical uh, semiotics, as I said before. Uh, semiotics should be able to accommodate results from psychology, sociology, and other disciplines. And now what makes cognitive semiotics difference is not only as I did in this book, I, I refer to many psychological experiments and sociological experiments, and I try to understand them in semiotical terms. But what we do nowadays in cognitive semiotics, which is in addition to that, is that we can make our own experiments, and that means for, for the beginning we can define them in semiotic terms. So if psychological experiments, as they are formulated, may sometimes be relevant and sometimes not quite relevant from a semiotical point of view, we can make now experiments where we have decided beforehand that they will give us answers which are semiotically relevant. Uh, another important thing is uh, as written in a book by Thomas Dadizio in 1994, uh, that who, who I think was the first way really who proposed that you should somehow integrate 
uh, semiotics and cognitive science um, that, that should allow you to relate semiotic structures uh, like languages and, and other science systems to psychic and social structures and abilities. That is the use to which we are put. And what we have done so far, that is not, of course, the only possibility, we have used that often to study evolution of meaning, of science, but also our children acquire science and other meanings. Uh, so to study evolution and development, and I will talk more about that at the end of this lecture series. Now, what in comparison then is cognitive science? Well, it's the coming together of a series of other independent sciences, such as linguistics, philosophy, psychology, biology, and computer science. Um, and from the beginning, the model was taken from the computer and applied to human beings. So in, co in cognitive science, they thought that the computer somehow worked in the same way as the human mind. Um, now there are many traditions in cognitive science which has distanced themselves from this metaphor, which is clearly inadequate. And they are much more inspired by psychology, talking about things like theory of mind. And many of them have also taken to use of phenomenology in the sense defined by Edmund Husserl, to which we will, which we will mention more later. So which, sem which semiotics? OK, there's something strange here. Okay, I should have shown this before, because which semiotics do we apt for? Well, it's the tradition which, as I said, is a long tradition of meaning and communication, and not concerned only with language, but different semiotic systems, such as gestures, music, and pictures, uh, as compared to each other and in, as interacting and which is interdisciplinary, that it, it uh, relates to other kinds of social and human sciences, and also to biology, in fact. Um, semiotics, which we don't want to follow, is either those which are restricted to discussing specific artworks. We want rather to, to get to, to more generalized results. And also those which are very vague and speculative. Um, okay, now, sorry, I had some disorder here in my, my uh, slides, so let's return now to cognitive science. So we can say here are some of the important figures in, in cognitive science. Um, I will mention some of them, mostly those who are written in large letters here. We will turn to them. Uh, exactly. Tomasello, Donna, Deacon, and Sperber. So, now we come to which cognitive sciences? Well, here you have, on the one hand, I don't know if you recognize these people. This is um, Dan Sahavi. Uh, at the left, and, and uh, Daniel Bennett at the right. Mm. So the positive side of according to science is, is interdisciplinarity, once again. Uh, what Howard Gardner a long time ago called the new science of the mind. It's also the systematic utilization of experimental and observational data in combination with modeling. Uh, which may be computational or not. And this part of cognitive science is increasing and moving away from the computer metaphor of mind to notions such as the embodied mind, the extended mind, for e cognition. These are terms which are relevant also for cognitive 
uh, semiotics. What we don't want to follow from cognitive science is the Dennett side, a strong bias towards physicalism, computationalism, that is some, some kind of reductionism, uh, and difficulty, uh, rather it's impossible in those terms to deal with issues of values, subjectivity, normativity, and intersubjectivity. Actually, you could generalize say that and say that it's impossible in those terms to deal with meaning. And also, cognitive science in that direction is polarized on central notions such as representation, intention, and innateness. Uh, linguistics is, of course, too long to mention everybody of relevance here. Uh, but, as you saw, we don't want to emphasize Chomsky, Fodor, or Lakoff, who we think uh, are very reductionist in our view. So we are more interested in the more classical tradition in, in linguistics, which has a broader scope, and it goes at least from the uh, ideologues at the time of Enlightenment to uh, cultural, uh, to co mm. Cognitive grammar such as Langacker, Talmy, Fauconier, and Turner. Okay, um, so again, what linguistics? The positive side is the focus on what clearly makes human communication and culture special, uh, how, how that is different from other kinds of. Uh, activities and systems. It's a traditional systematic analysis of different kinds of evidence, intuitions, observations, experimentation, and also moving away from the idea of self-contained systems, uh, like in, in uh, functional linguistics. Language is part of a bigger whole, and so are, of course, as I said before, in, when I talked about semiotics, all semiotic systems. Uh, the negative tradition in, in linguistics is, of course, the Chomsky tradition mostly, uh, which have a lot of definitional problems. What exactly is language? And do, where do the borders go with paralinguistic systems like gestures and emotional prosody? Uh, interface problems, rather denying the relation to cognition, word knowledge, and communication. Uh, and the proverbial division between schools, structural, generative, cognitive, ecological. So, I'm coming close to the end now, and I would like to say something about methods. Of course, we will talk a lot about methods later, but this is a general overview. You can study different things. Uh, you can study phenomena which are first person, second person, or third person. You can also call that, you will see, you can also maybe call this better subjectivity, intersubjectivity, and objectivity. So, and I think it's important to make a division here on about the phenomena which you study and the method of access you have to these phenomena. Um, which something which is of course very clear if you study subjectivity and your mode of access is subjectivity, that is clearly introspection. You try to discover in your own mind what you are thinking. Um, but if you want to study into subjectivity, um, that is the relation between people, who they understand each other, how it's possible that we have so much in common, that we are not close to each other. Uh, you can study that using empathy, you try to understand the other, of course, uh, must be very systematic, it's going to be a scientific method. But a more 
you can also have a mode of subject of access to into subjectivity through into subjectivity, and that would be dialogue. You enter the dialogue with somebody, and you 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 analyze the dialogue. Um, so all these cases are perhaps not very relevant. Uh, some of them seem difficult to realize. But we will be mostly interested here in two, sorry, in two of them, that's one is phenomenology and the other is experimentation. As you can see, both are really studies of objectivity because they are supposed to study what is valid for us all. Uh, phenomenology uses the approach of subjectivity like in introspection, you try to study what is in your own mind, but what you try to find is the invariance of meaning, the invariance of, of thinking. And in experimentation, of course, you study objectivity in a quite objective way. You look at it from the outside. You realize uh, experiments with a lot of groups of people. You make you count uh, how many people do certain things. So that's a quite objective approach to objectivity. But we argue that both these methods are necessary and complementary. If not, you will never understand the relevance of results in an in a experimental situation. So what is phenomenology? It was invented you can say by the philosopher Edmund Husserl at the end of the 19th century and going on. Uh, his work went on in the beginning of the 20th century and he had a lot of students who, disciples rather, who, who extended his approach. We're going to mention some of them here. Uh, but some way or kind, so it's phenomenology is the study of human experience and of the way things present themselves to us in and through such experience. So the important thing, as we will see, and we will go deeper into phenomenology, is to study uh, how things appear to us. These are the invariants of meaning, which I mentioned. Another way of saying this, a careful description of what appears to consciousness precisely in the manner of its appearing. Uh, we have occasion to, to talk more about what that exactly means. So, a third definition or characterization. Phenomenology studies structures of conscious experience as experience from the first person point of view along with relevant conditions of experience. The central structure of experience is its intentionality, the way it is directed through its content or meaning towards a certain object in the world. We have a, we have a lot to say about intentionality later. Now, uh, this is also an important tradition for us. It's not necessarily with Husserl. He had important um, uh, continuators, for example, uh, Edith Stein, who, who was the assistant of Husserl, but who also wrote uh, important things about empathy, and other, thing, other phenomenologists who follow, developed his work as Aaron Gurwitch, who had a lot to say about the field of consciousness, Alfred Schutz, who, who uh, made uh, phenomenology into a social discipline, to its uh, foundation of social sciences. Merleau-Ponty, who may be more known, he is, insists a lot about the embodiment of a human being. Uh, Ricoeur, of course, many others who, has follow, who, has le who are less well known but have followed this and developed this tradition. And we have contemporary uh, uh, phenomenologists like Dan Zahavi and uh, Gallagher and Thompson, who are part of this 
approach which I mentioned within cognitive science, which makes use of phenomenology to better understand the science of the mind. And I will argue later that Peirce also for, for, uh, forms part of this tradition. As we see, he talked about phenomenology too, and his definition is very similar to that of Husserl. And I think that's an important parallel to make. So, this is a question, why phenomenology? Well, yes, because we need to have it as a method when we study some things experimentally, as I will insist on later, we have to place it in a context and uh, we have to understand the artificial situation created by the experiment in relation to the life world, the world taken for granted in which we live. That's why we need phenomenology. Now, phenomenology is not only uh, a philosophical approach. James Gibson the, was a well-known uh, psychologist who, who made very, very important works on, on, um, on um, perception. And I will talk more, a lot about perception here because perception is somehow the first stage of meaning making well before science because even in perception we don't see what the natural science describes to us we see something which has meaning and I have a, have a quotation from uh, a fellow psychologist who says that Gibson like Mel Ponty you remember one of the disciples of, of Husserl worked on an argument to the effect that where what is out there, what we respond to, is a function to an important degree of us. For each attempts to reduce perception to passive sensation, where sensation was understood as a linear causal relation between external causes and specific local neural effects were rejected. Perception, in short, was behavior. More powerfully, perception was an activity. And I think this is not only in Merleau-Ponty, you find a lot of this already in Husserl. And in fact, um, one of the Gibson students who wrote a book about him, Lombroso, says that Gibson often quoted Husserl at his lectures, although he never mentioned him in any of his books. And uh, later, uh, cognitive scientists like uh, Camero uh, has written a book where he treats Gibson as one of the phenomenologists. So I think I'm very justified as I, to do what I did already in my, in my book in 1989 to treat Gibson as a phenomenologist and to think that phenomenologists can be uh, very much uh, related to empirical uh, research as was exactly what Gibson did. Now, I have only a small thing more to show you in this lecture. And that is something which we will look closer on in um, the next lecture. It's the way we uh, conceive uh, the domains of meaning in our experience. Uh, the outdoor domain of meaning is the Umwelt, which takes its name from a German biologist, uh, Uxkull, who said that biology was the science of meaning. So in one sense, all animals, even the simplest animals, uh, react to some meanings which they perceive in the world. Then there is the natural Lebenswelt, life world. The life world is, is a word that we as human beings take for granted. It, but it can be natural as when it's given only as experience as only a physical world, which is of course not physics in the sense of, of, of natural sciences. No. Physics as we experience it. 
and the cultural overlaying of that word, to which we have a very specific cultural overlaying, which is science. Because there are many meanings which are not science, they are primary to science. And science is something that we have find that uh, children learn to use very late, and apes have a lot of difficulty with science, some science at least. And then, of course, finally we come to the uh, specific science system. If that is language, it will be there, but it could also be pictures, it could be music, it could be uh, gesture, and certainly other things. So, now I have arrived to the end of this lecture. I'm not sure exactly where he said we were going to stop, but I, I think I can stop here. And uh, we will take a pause and continue the second lecture, if that's okay. Uh, if there are some very specific questions you have, I can take them. But I, I think this question is better uh, discussed, uh, taken up uh, in the tutorial this afternoon. But if you have some more specific thing you want to ask about this. I hope that some things which may seem complicated and obscure will become clearer as we go on. In a way, this is a summary.